Let's capitalize on that just for a second as you describe yourself. Uh, for some of you, uh, when we say the meet and greet, the very words you used feed right into it, right? Uh, and others of you, like, oh, it feeds right into it in a negative way. You know, for example, uh, one of the people I was talking to, they described themselves as an introvert. So this was like brutal, you know, I mean, like, oh, my, you know. And then, but they also said they're basically compliant. We said, okay, I'll do it. I'm compliant. <laughs> All right, I'm in, I'm in. Uh, but, you know, it's hard, to, hard to, to meet with those two people who are already talking. And so, uh, oh, somehow it's touching a, 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 a nerve back here. Okay. Uh, and so some of you are like, hey, Mr. Friendly, you know, and I'm in. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so the, for me, I, I would say probably two words that describe me is one, friendly, uh, and the other is um, bent towards justice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's a hyphenated word, <laughs> bent towards justice, all hyphenated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and the key, yeah, the real follower. And uh, and if you want to have to put that down, let's just start with bent. Okay, um, <laughs> uh, just bent. We yeah, we got that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you guys, welcome today. Um, uh, for if you've been coming, you know we've been in probably the longest series in the history of America uh, in a <laughs> church, uh, and we've tried to make it new and different every week. But it, 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 we're only four weeks from the end, so I uh, know that this series is about done. Uh, but we've called this series uh, t- that we want to find our focus. And, uh, and the, foc- the, the imp- purpose of this was to really help us individually and as a corporate body find our focus. What are we all about? What do we need to focus on? And so there's been four things. And so the first one we start, we've talked about twice in a series here, is belong. Um, the need to belong. And the key word to this is connection. That people need to be connected. And we've got to be in connection. Uh, so uh, hopefully we've emphasized that enough, but I would say we probably haven't done the greatest job of helping you be connected, just so you know. So this coming summer, one of our biggest goals is going to be how do we uh, connect people and assimilate people uh, into relationship. Uh, and so we've got some things to do here. We've got some work to do uh, for the summer, and then be going towards the fall, how are we going to help you be connected? So uh, it's really important to us. Second was we want to equip people. We want to equip them for the ministry, equip them for life, and the key word to that has been maturity. Um, that we really want to help people be mature, not just kind of active. You know, if you know what I mean. We don't act activity it never replaces maturity, right? It's got to be all about maturity. Third, and we just finished four weeks, and, uh, and last week you guys have heard so much great feedback from uh, Jake, what Jake uh, shared last week. So thank you. Not only thank Jake, uh, but thank you for your input and your feedback on him doing such a great job. But we've been talking about prayer and the reality that we need to be dependent on him. And one of the ways to express our dependence on God is to pray, which is this very strange thing. Really, prayer isn't a kind of uh, in an odd thing. You're going to be talking to a person you cannot see, sharing your heart with someone you've never laid eyes on. I mean, really, let's talk about it. It's a little freaky, right? I mean, a little strange. Uh, Let's be honest about it. Um, And yet you're believing there is a God who is there, who is listening. It's not just the wall in front of you or the ceiling above you or the floor below you. Uh, there is a God who is in the midst of it, and you're depending on him and engaging him. So it's most the most natural thing in the world, because we all pray, especially in a foxhole, right, when life is really crummy uh, and it just stinks. You just, you, there's a sense you just say, well, you know, you just pray. Um, and yet it's really weird, right? Okay, let's face it. So there's this thing called prayer, and then uh, this week we're going to start a four-week series on what we call REACH. Um, and the subtitle of REACH has got to be about compassion, and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to do this. Um, this next slide. There are four pivotal dimensions to our framework for this reach and compassion section. And we're going to touch on each one of those one week. So the first one we're going to touch on for week one is the nature of God. Now you think, oh, okay, that'll be easy to cover in a week, right? Uh, so it's going to be a challenge to do it in one week, and we'll just do the best we can. The second week, what we're going to talk about is the nature of mankind the true nature, at least a biblical view of the nature of mankind. What are we about? What are we like? What describes us? Uh, The third week we're going to do this is we're going to talk about the nature of Jesus, the nature of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, um, which already describes our angle on this of who he is and what he did and what that's all about. And then the fourth week we're going to talk about what I call the rules of engagement. Okay, there are rules of engagement. That's what the army has when they go into a situation. There are rules of engagement, things you can do, things you can't do, things you ought to do, things you ought not to do, um, and the rules of engagement. We're going to talk about that as a result of the nature of God, the nature of mankind, the nature of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. So what about the rules of engagement? 
What do you do? How do we do it? Why do we do it? What's acceptable, what's not in, in these rules of engagement? So we're, the, this morning we're going to talk about, first of all, the nature of God. And it seems to me that when we come to talk about the nature of God, there are two fundamental questions we begin to wrestle with. First of all is, does he exist? Does God exist at all? Now, the vast majority of people, when taking a survey, believe that there is a God. Um, so we have a sense of it, right? Now, the Old Testament starts with these words. In the beginning, God. It assumes his reality. It doesn't try to prove it. It doesn't spend any time doing that. It assumes his, pre- his, his reality. Uh, in the beginning, God. And in a sense, we, we do that. Uh, I, I would say there's probably some evidence that we could look for uh, that proves the existence of God. One, it's frankly, uh, is nature. The creative element of nature. Romans tells us that, that what, from what we see and what has been created, it is undoubtedly that he exists. Um, and so when we look out there and we see this incredible detail and incredible beauty, and not just out there, but frankly, in recent years in science, um, we, we understand that there has got to be a God who made this thing. Even if you look at the way that blood coagulates, it is one of the most complicated systems that you could ever imagine. And without a very detailed sequence of events of the way that blood coagulates, when you hurt yourself and started to bleed, you would bleed to death almost within minutes if there was just not this amazing thing that blood does. For that to have evolved is an, would be incredibly, would cause you to have so much faith. It'd be, it'd be stunning. Um, and, and so the, the existence of God in the midst of creation there's also another place I think we can begin to wonder if God exists is when the fact of the human conscience. Where did it come from? What happens there? Could that have just happened out of nowhere, the fact that you have a conscience, a place inside your soul that wrestles with right and wrong, not only externally to yourself, but internally to yourself? Human conscience begins to suggest that there is a conscience giver in the existence of God. The second question we begin to wrestle with is, if there is a God, what is he like? What is he actually really like? It's so easy for us not to really wrestle with that question. Or if we wrestle with with these questions, we wrestle with them on an academic level. We kind of a, a polemic level, an argument level, an apologetic level. Let's set out the four things, you know, that'll satisfy the brain, in a sense, or your mind. And that's important. But I think we all know that eventually to answer these two questions, there's a time and a place where it becomes a hard issue. When life happens, especially when life happens and it's not so fun and not so comfortable and not so easy, we begin to wrestle with these things at a profound personal level. And we begin to wonder about these things. For me, Oddly enough, it happened in middle school. So you begin to think, oh, this is just for adults. No way it's not just for adults. You know what? These young people, middle school, high school, elementary school, are wrestling with these things. They're very bright people. And and they're not just kind of, you know, dull. They're they're very in tune. For me, it happened, my parents were taking us to church somewhat, but I found it to be profoundly boring. Um, and very inappropriate. And they, in seventh grade, they put the guys and the gals together into a Sunday school class, and they would make you read from the Bible, King James Bible. Um, and, uh, and so I'm in a class for the first time with girls. I, I'm in seventh grade. It's a little bit weird. You know, I, I wanted them to think I was cool uh, when I wasn't really actually all that cool, you know? And, uh, and so then they, you'd have to read out of the Bible, King James, and I don't read well. I have a reading issue. And so then there are names in that Bible that seems very strange to me. They're very like, what, are they, what is that name? You know, I don't even know how to pronounce it. And so they'd come to me and I would read and I would just stumble. And I didn't do well and I hated every second. And so I told my parents, could we stop going to church, please? And they said, sure. And we stopped going, our whole family. God was never mentioned in my home whatsoever. Not one time that I ever remember God being mentioned in my home growing up. But then in seventh grade, I had one of my really good friends who was an eighth grade wrestler, incredible athlete, never had lost a match in his whole life, go out for the track team and die of a heart attack. And I began to wrestle with, is is there a God? And if there is a God, what is he like? 
And then in ninth grade, David Swanson, one of my better friends, he and a bunch of the rest were getting involved in something I didn't understand, which was really the early days of the drug culture. And, the, and David, one night, decided to dress up like a lady and rob a, jo- rob a, a lady's dress store. Odd, weird thing. And when he came out, the policeman thought he was armed and the policeman shot him and killed him. And I began to wrestle with, is there a God and what is he like? And what is life like? And where was David headed? And I was headed a little bit on that same road with David. And what's going on in this whole thing? Have you ever been there where you begin to wrestle with, is there really a God and what is he like? Of course, we all do. In the movie, uh, you know, really in the life of Patch Adams, uh, Patch Adams was a, guy, a physician, grew up in, uh, uh, he was born in uh, Washington, D.C., but he grew up a uh, part of his life in Germany where while his father was stationed in Germany, his father died while he was there. He was just a high school kid. Dad died. He moved back to the United States and Patch Adams began to really wrestle. His, name, his real name was uh, Hunter Adams and uh, he began to wrestle with life and within one year tried to kill himself three times. Um, had lost all hope that life had any meaning whatsoever but decided that he wanted to live he wanted to make a difference, and so he went to medical school, and he's become kind of a, an oddball kind of a doctor. He does it a little differently, you know, and uh, he takes groups of doctors all over the world, uh, and they dress up like clowns in order to reach kids and comfort kids, but in the midst of it, he struggled with life. He struggled with the deep questions of life, um, and in the movie, he's played by, um, by Robin Williams. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip. I want you to see it for what it is in the movie of Patch Adams' life. But it is almost painful, frankly, to, s- to watch it and see how these things played out in Robin's life personally. Um, and so this clip comes at a time after one of Patch Adams' best friends had been murdered. And he's wrestling with these issues. So watch this clip. We all get that, don't we? We get what he's saying and the difficulties that he's going through. And he's asking God, why? What? I don't get it. Why didn't you spend that seventh day on compassion rather than whatever, on resting? And then he turns to say, you're not worth it. It seems to me when we ask these questions, is, does God exist? And if so, what is he like? We're really wrestling with this. Are we deciding that God is worth cooperating with Or is God worth competing with? Or is God simply worth ignoring? Those are the choices we have. And people are making those every day. We make that decision every day. Whether we will simply cooperate with him and understand his authority and his awesomeness and his beauty and his majesty, Or do we think that maybe he's something less he's worth fighting with and competing against and winning over, or at least on top of, or will we simply ignore him? Those are the realities of what we wrestle with. And he came to that point. You're not worth it, God. Now I want to finish the clip um, because I think in Patch Adams' life and in this movie it shows that maybe it's not quite so hopeless. Obviously, the movie's trying to communicate that there may be something beyond all the pain is th- rather than that just being it. And so it really ha- ma- makes us kind of try to have to define what God is like. And, and now, trying to define what he's like, that's like get, trying to get your arms around a really huge tree, right? You just can't do it. This past weekend, Diane and I were in Southern California for the daughter's wedding of a friend. And uh, the place where it happened, it was at a resort out be- kind of between San Bernardino and Palm Springs, up at about a 3,000 feet at this place called Highlands Springs Resort. And on that resort, there was an oak tree. And that oak tree was 1,100 years old. The, 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 I mean, the, y- you couldn't probably eight or nine of us couldn't have put our arms together and gotten around it. It was amazing. I should have brought a picture, but, and it showed all the scars of life of 1,100 years, um, all the gnarly, brutal things of that. Um, But we begin to say, uh, I can't get my arms all the way around God, right, for sure. Uh, He's bigger than we know. He's bigger than he's revealed. The scriptures tell us what he's like, but frankly, he's bigger than that. 
Uh, it only reveals enough that we could maybe possibly try to understand. But I'm going to try to eliminate God down to two words. Um, so it might be foolish. Okay, but let me give it a try. Okay, I'm going to put it as this. That he is infinite and he is intimate. That God is infinite and he is intimate. Let, let me put some other words to it, but I want you to hold on to those two. He is infinite and he is intimate. Okay, I'm going to try a couple of other words. First of all, he is holy. And we don't talk about that much, right? That God is holy. Uh, it's uncomfortable. So little in our world is holy. And I think we understand that if we engage God as holy, there's something there that we're going to have to wrestle with and deal with. Something very, very uncomfortable for us, that God is holy in every way, perfect, morally beautiful. He's everything. He's holy, but he's also loving. There is a God who describes, you know, Isaiah said that holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But also we find in 1 John, it says that God is love. He is both holy and he is loving all at the same time. Let me put a couple of other words. He is truth. He is truth. There is absolute truth in the world and he is it. He defines it. He lives it. He's described it. He's, he's everything about it. He is truth. But he is also grace. Grace, the giving of undeserved favor to people without requirement. It's given. He is grace. He is truth and grace all at the same time. Okay, there are a couple other words. He is unapproachable. In his holiness, God is absolutely unapproachable. If we were to find him in his glory, if we were to see him in his glory, we would fall on our face and we would simply say, oh, wretched man that I am in his absolute beauty. We don't really like that. You see, we have replaced God being the center of the universe with man being the center of the universe. We have made man... Don't make man uncomfortable. Here's the deal. God will make us uncomfortable because of who he is. We don't really like that. So in our culture, we have absolutely replaced God with ourselves to make it comfortable. But he is unapproachable in all that he is, frankly, but he is also incredibly engaging. God engages us. That's just, it's amazing, isn't it? You know, try this one on precise. He is sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now, you think, wow. Now, how many of some of you remember, how many, I want to see a show of hands, an American literature class or some sort of English class in high school, how many read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards? How many have never heard of it? Okay, yeah. Okay, so Jonathan Edwards, 1741. He's a pastor in Enfield, Massachusetts, and that's going on to the Great Awakening, okay? Now, the Great Awakening, you just go back and read the history of America in the 1740s, and you'll find a very decadent country. And it happened primarily in the Northeast, but a place that it's incredibly broken, not just outside of the church, but inside of the church. And Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest preachers uh, probably in American history, he's in this church which had been his grandfather's, which had turned sort of universalism, anybody and everybody, no big deal, do whatever you'd like to do. And he really said, God's holiness is so violated here that we don't understand the wrath of God. Now, you guys, I don't know how many churches are going to talk about the wrath of God today, but let's face it, we don't talk about it much. And because it's not comfortable. We think, oh, the wrath of God, it makes him mean and ugly and stinky and, and we want to move away from that. But here's the deal. God's wrath is real in that God is so um, upset, if you will, with the violation of his beauty that we do not only to him, but to each other. God is not a wimpish God who is simply sits around and could care less about the things that we do to one another. Remember what happened right after they got thrown out of the garden in Genesis? The first two brothers, Cain and Abel. A and Cain kills his brother Abel because he's jealous. And God comes to him and says, hey, what's the deal? And Abel says, I mean, Cain says, what, am I my brother's keeper? Not my problem. And God says, it sure is. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. And the violation that we do to one another. 
When's the last time you murdered somebody? You know, if you read USA Today, there's an article out there that says, this is, the, is this the beginning of the season of murder again in America here in the spring? Have you read the number of murders across our nation and the violation we do to each other? But how many ask you, how many of you murdered someone this past week? With your words? With the way you deal with each other? The way you talk with each other? Maybe your spouse, you just stuck a knife in them. Or your friends? Or whatever? See, God's wrath is real because he hates what is evil. He hates what we do to each other. He hates how we violate his authority because his authority leads us to what is acceptable and good and perfect and beautiful. And yet we choose a different way, wanting him to do our own thing. And God's wrath is real. We are sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's true. But you know what? There's also this deal, that we are sinners in the hands of a gracious God. And we turn to him. His grace is beyond imagination. His love and acceptance, it's totally stunning. How about this? Kind of the difference between common grace, that which is God's graciousness to everyone in every way. You know what? The weather just today is is, really is amazing, isn't it? This weekend, like stunning. Let's do this all year. I'm I'm voting for it today. (laughs) But guess what? This weather was for everybody, right? He didn't choose it just for you. He gave it to everybody. He gave it to your neighbor. He gave it to your boss at work, even if you don't like him or her. He gave it to them too. You see, his common grace is for everyone and to draw them to himself. But there is also a special grace that God gives, this specialness of his grace that he draws and calls people to himself to experience this incredible forgiveness and redemption. And his voice is calling people and some are listening and some are not. It is a special grace, is what we call it theologically. And he's doing that. That is what God is like. He gives common grace to all and he gives special grace to those who will listen to his voice and respond to his call. Wow. So let's go back. His infinite and intimateness of who God is. Okay? Now, let me me just, for a second here, let's just look at a couple of passages. The whole Bible's about this, right? I could just start in Genesis and go through all, all the way through Revelation and we'd get done in about... Uh, three and a half weeks uh, here this morning. Okay, so it would take us a long time. But let me just see if I can touch on a little bit. Uh, When we talk about his infiniteness, God is infinite. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is all-loving. He is all that. He is all of it. I chose kind of an odd one, frankly, to to throw at you this morning. But in 1 John chapter 3, he's talking about how do we know that we know God? How could we know that? And he says this in verses 18, 19, and 20 of 1 John 3. He says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. You see, I think he's saying that you can know that you know God if he has turned you from just having words to having having moved to say, I want to make a difference. I want to love in deed and in truth. I really want to go there. It's easy to talk the game, right? But God moves us to a new place. Then in verse 19, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, and I'm going to stop there for a second. Our hearts condemn us for a couple of different reasons. One, is we condemn ourselves when we face the truth of our lives. There is a condemnation that happens in our hearts because we realize we fell so desperately short. There's also a condemnation that happens in our heart when Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser. He says to you, you're worthless. You don't have what it takes. You disgust me. You are an embarrassment. You will never amount to anything. You are so broken. Forget it. Don't even try coming back. We get accused and our hearts get condemned. And we are left in a place of guilt and shame, right? And God has nothing to do with guilt and shame. He has everything to do with helping us have godly sorrow that turns us towards the light rather than shoves us into the darkness. Here it says, whenever our hearts condemn us, comma, God is greater than our heart. 
You see, God is greater than the heart of mankind and the condemnation that happens here. God is bigger than that. See, God is infinite. God is all these things, and he can be all these things in us if we simply allow him to be that. Wow. That God is greater than our heart. And then, comma, he knows everything. God is bigger than all that chaos and craziness and shame that we live with. And he moves us to a place of sorrow to move towards him because God is bigger than that, our hearts. And God knows everything about us. And he still says, you are the object of my love. This past weekend when we were in California, one of our friends from there, young gal, college-age student, has been searching for love in all of the wrong places, in all the wrong people, in all the wrong ways. And she she is trying to figure out that she is adored because she is a beautiful young lady. And not because she's beautiful physically, because she is beautiful, because God, she is a creation of God. And she is bought into all sorts of lies that are taking her down one road and needs to go down another. And he knows everything about her. And he says to her, I know everything about you, not only the way I created you, but what you've done with your life. And I want you to know that you are the object of my love and my affection. Wow, it's incredible. God is infinite because he knows everything about it. But I want to look at the fact that he's intimate also. Not just infinite, but intimate. Look at this, Luke 15. It's one of my favorite stories. It's the story of the prodigal son. So Jesus tells this story, all right? So Jesus, uh, this is not a true story. He makes it up. It's a fictional story. He's trying to describe the relationship of God, the Father, to people, uh, some who have lived kind of a crazy, wild, nutty life, others who have tried to live a really nice religious life. That's the older brother. Um, And the younger brother comes to dad, and he says to dad, hey, dad, I want my inheritance. Now, just so you know, this doesn't happen in Jewish culture until the dad dies. You don't get your your half until he dies. But the young son says, hey, you know what? I'd really like my inheritance right now. And what he's really actually saying to the dad is, dad, I wish you were dead. I'm going to disrespect you so stinking much that I want my money right now. So dad, stick it, is really what he's saying. Dad, I don't care for you. I have nothing for you that I care about. I want my money and I want it now. Please give it to me. And And the dad gives him his half. And he goes off and he lives like a wild man. He's just a playboy. He does all the fun stuff. He's doing all the wild living. It's absolute chaos. But eventually the money runs out, unfortunately. Uh, or maybe it is fortunate that it did. But he, it all runs out and he has to go get a job. And eventually the only job he can get is, in a, is farming pigs. For a Jew to farm pigs is an abomination. And in fact, when he's working with the pigs, eventually what the pigs are eating looks very attractive to him. And eventually, the scripture says he comes to himself. He realizes where he is at. He comes to a place of repentance. He comes to a place of brokenness. He comes to a place where he says, what am I doing here? This is crazy. Even the servants back on the ranch, on the farm, or whatever they call it in Israel. But even the servants do better than this. And he he says to himself, I know, I understand that I have violated my father so deeply that I can't go back and be a son. But if I could go back and be a servant and simply work on the farm, that would be better than what I'm doing here. He never expected to be reinstated. He just wanted a job where he didn't have to eat pig stew, okay? And so he says, he goes back. And, And so what happens here is, listen, in verse 20. He says, and he arose and he came to his father. But, this is one of the great places. In the scriptures, always circle your butts, okay? Just circle this butt. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Really? How did he see him so far away? Was he looking for him? Was he anticipating his return? If you're a dad and you've had a wayward child, you know. He was looking. You know that he was anticipating this, hoping for this, praying for this, desiring this. His heart was for it. You get it, right? Of course. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And what did he feel? He felt compassion. Wow. 
There is an intimacy in this word compassion that's hard to even describe. It is a heartfelt pouring out a bleeding desire for the good of his son. Now, had he ever had reports of what was going on in the son's life in this distant land where he was simply living chaotically and eventually works in a pig farm and is eating pig food? Yeah, he probably did. But he waited for the son to come to the end of himself to understand. So he returns and it says that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and he ran. Just so you know, Jewish fathers do not run. It was a demeaning thing. They stand and you come to them. In his robe, can you just imagine? He probably reached down and grabbed his robe and he pulled it up a little bit because it gets in the way and he is struck and he is booking it towards the sun, right? He is, wow, he's running. And he embraced him and he kissed him, this sign of great intimacy. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned. He owns up. He's realistic. He's honest. He's repentant. He says, Father, I have so done what's wrong. And I've sinned against God himself. I've sinned against heaven. And I've sinned before you. Father, I treated you so badly. I'm so sorry. Let's go to the next. And he says in verse 21 at the end part, he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I recognize that. He does not expect it. But the father doesn't listen. And he says this, but the father said to the servants, whatever, you know, to, to his son. And he says, bring quickly the best robe. Not just a robe. The robe is a sign of beauty, a sign of authority, a sign of, uh, of belongingness. And he says, bring the best one. The one that I don't even wear very often. The, the best robe in the whole place. Bring it here quickly. And then he says, put it on him. And and put a ring on his, on his hand, a sign of authority. A sign, that ring then was a family ring, okay? And it had, it had the, probably the insignia of the family. And it represented the authority of that family. And he puts it on him and it says, All in, you are reinstated in total as my son. All the authority here. Now just think about this. He had already spent his half. He had treated his dad with incredible disdain, contempt. And he, and he, had, he had basically said, I'll compete with you, God, if I want to. And I'll ignore you if I want to. And now in his brokenness, he comes and his dad just puts a ring on his finger and a robe on his back. And it says he puts shoes on his feet. Shoes were were reserved for family. Servants didn't wear shoes. Only those who were part of the family got shoes. And it says they put shoes on his feet. And then he says, and bring the fatted calf. Just so you know, in, in, in those days, they very seldom ate meat. It would usually be lamb, chicken, isn't that the same as today? And, uh, you know, eat more chicken. And uh, so it was the early Chick-fil-A deal. And, uh, <laughs> and so he says, uh, they didn't eat meat very often. It was only for special times, only for really celebratory times. And he says, go get the fatted calf that we've been fattening up for a long time. And I've been probably reserving this calf for this when he returns. So he says, go kill the fatted calf and, uh, and let us eat and what? And celebrate. Don't you need him to grovel for a while? He said, no, I don't need him to grovel. And he says, for my son was dead, verse 24, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And then I love this, they began to celebrate. You see, you guys, church is a party. You've heard it before. But church is a party for those who need a party for those who have been away and eating pig food. Those who have missed and they have competed with God, they have ignored God, they have no interest in God. Church is a place for a party for them. Wow. So I just want two comments here about this infinite and intimate dimensions of God. First of all is this. If God is infinite but not intimate, he would simply be harsh. Okay? If God is, intimate, is in infinite, but not intimate, he is simply harsh. Secondly, if God is intimate, but not infinite, he would simply be inadequate to take on the realities of a broken world. 
and he would be inadequate to take on the lies of our broken lives. He couldn't do it. But here's the deal. God is not harsh. That's not who he is. Now, most of our country thinks he is, if he exists at all. That he's harsh, and he's actually not at all in any way. Is he full of truth? Absolutely. Is he holy? Absolutely. Is he unapproachable? Absolutely. Is he sinners in the hands of an angry God? Absolutely. But he is not harsh. But also, God is not inadequate. He is totally adequate because he is intimate with his people. He is grace and he is love. He is intimate with us in so many ways, so profoundly that moves our lives. You see, God is worthy of our cooperation rather than competing with him or ignoring him. God is worthy of that. So the question has to be for this. For the skeptic, if you're here this morning and you're a skeptic, or if we, are, if we gather a large groups of skeptics in this room, or if you're an inquirer, or frankly, for the convinced, we have some questions we have to ask ourselves. And I want you to ask yourselves here this morning. I'll give you a little bit of time to wrestle with it. First is this. Are you competing with God in your life? Are you competing with him for authority? to be the center of the world, of your world? Are you competing with God? Where are you competing with him? Where are you wrestling with him? And, and you guys, every person on planet Earth, every person in the United States, every person in St. Louis County, every person in this community is wrestling with these questions. Does God exist and what is he like? And will I compete with him or not? Where are they competing? Where are you competing with God for your life? Second question. Where are you ignoring God? You've just decided to kind of go your own independent way and that fellowship with God has been broken. Where are you just simply ignoring him? Where are you actively, rebelliously pushing him away and com competing with him? But where are you simply ignoring him? It doesn't really work. He's still there. But you feel like you can ignore him. Where are you simply ignoring him? Shutting up and not listening. Third question. Where are you cooperating with God? W where does he need you or want you to cooperate with him? And it seems to me that then if we were to begin to cooperate with him, we'd have to say, what would he do? What would he do in my life? Would he make me, make me wear a bun on the top of my head and be a missionary in Africa? I mean, is that what he's going to do? That's what they, they used to, girls, girls used to be afraid of. <laughs> Guys, in the mission field these days, there is almost a more aggressive presence of women than men. Are we afraid to risk it all for the glory of who he is? To step forward and to lead, to reject passivity, accept responsibility, to lead courageously and expect that God shows up and his blessings in the midst of it. Are we willing to do it? Do, are we afraid that his will might be a mess or would his will possibly be really good qualitatively good? Would his will possibly be acceptable, doable? Would his will be possibly perfect in the midst of an imperfect world? Wow, what would it be? So if, here's, here's my final statement then. God's nature, who God is, implies for all of us, the skeptic, the inquirer, and the already convinced, it implies that his presence is both infinitely and intimately good. If you believed that God was really like that, wouldn't you move towards him quickly? That God is infinitely and, and intimately good in his presence. What about the, the fact that he would be infinitely and intimately acceptable, what he has for my life? And not all of it's going to be easy, right? Of course it's not. Remember back with James and John? And Jesus said, 
where they were saying, hey, can I be at your right hand? I can be at your left. And he says, are you guys ready to drink the cup? Are you guys ready for the baptism that I'm, it's going to happen of suffering? Are you ready for that? So part of it is not going to be easy, but, it, but it's better than trying to avoid all the hard things in life because eventually they catch up with you anyway, right? Of course they do. You can't avoid all of that. And what about if both of, that we were both, that was both infinitely and intimately perfect, What if people actually saw God like that, that he is both infinite and intimate? Would that God be worth knowing? Would that God be worth engaging? Would that God be worth surrendering to? You see, this is the beginning of the gospel, right? The the beginning of the gospel is not mankind. The beginning of the gospel is God himself. The beginning of life is really God himself when we come to the end of ourselves. Now, we come to the end of ourselves quite often, it seems, in life. But for me, the very first time was when I was in middle school. And I began to see that life was bigger than I could ever be. The problems were things that I could not solve. That there was a brokenness to the world, and I began to see a brokenness to me that only God could answer and engage. And that is the beginning of the gospel. So here's the the two words I want you to remember for this week. We'll have two more next week. The nature of man is he is infinite and he is intimate. So if anybody asks you this week, what is God like? You'll be able to say he's profoundly infinite, but he is amazingly intimate. And that reality will shape everything we do in life. Okay? So let's worship him for those things the fact that he is infinite and the fact that he is intimate. So the band's going to come. And you guys, music, all it helps us do is take this melody that is in your heart right now and help you do it together to express it, okay? So let's pray as they come up. Father, it's it's almost laughable, frankly, that we even try to address who you are, except the reality is that you have revealed yourself to us. You have described yourself. And we have found that you, in actuality, from what the scriptures tell us, that you are infinite in every way. You are beautiful to the nth degree. You are awesome. You are majestic. That your heart beats for us because you made us and you love us, that you are intimate and that you see us when we are far away and when we come, you run to us and you embrace us and you kiss us and you put a robe on our back and you put sandals on our feet and you put a ring on our finger and you kill the fatted calf. We know that to be Christ, to pay for that reconciliation. Father, help us never to forget that you are infinite and infinite.